Hi, I'm Chris Potts. This is our second of three screencasts about our compositional semantic grammar. The first reviewed technical preliminaries, and the third walks through the mechanics of the grammar itself. This screencast introduces the semantic lexicon, which is the basis for much of the system. Let's start with proper names. For us, these directly refer. These expressions use the double brackets as the semantic interpretation function. So the top left one can be read as, the meaning of the proper name Maggie is the entity Maggie. Very straightforward. Next, we'll do nouns and intransitive verbs. These all denote one-place functions in our system. This expression here is a kind of general framework for defining n and intransitive v meanings. The outer lambda x means that we're talking about a function that takes one entity argument. When that argument comes in, the return value is either a t or an f, true or false, depending on whether the argument is in whatever set we specify here. The nature of this set determines the particular meaning that we're defining. Here's a couple of examples. Notice that they differ only in what set is involved. For this one, we're saying that the word Simpson denotes the function that returns true for Maggie, Lisa, Bart, and Homer, and false for all other entities. By the correspondence between characteristic sets and characteristic functions discussed in the last screencast, we can see that this is equivalent semantically to saying that Simpson denotes the set of all Simpsons. Here's a couple of V examples. They have the same shape as the ends. They name different sets, that's all. Transitive verbs are a different sort of beast. Here's the framework for them. These are functions of two entity arguments. Once again, once the arguments are in, we return a T or F based on set membership. But now it's membership of a pair of entities in a set of pairs of entities. Uh, here's an example. It's the verb admires. Imagine we're talking about a sentence like Homer admires Lisa. Intuitively, Lisa will correspond to the Y argument, she's the grammatical object, and Homer to the X argument, the grammatical subject. Then the sentence will be true given this meaning because the pair containing Homer and Lisa in that order is a member of the set that determines the core meaning for admires as it's given here. It's important to keep track of how these arguments come in, so let's dive a bit deeper into this computation. We start with the meaning of admire, and on the right we indicate that we're applying this function to Maggie. She comes in and knocks out the outer lambda y, and then we substitute her for the variable y in the body of the expression. At this point, we have something with the same shape as an intransitive verb. The meaning is the function that returns true for an entity if that entity admires Maggie and false otherwise. To get to a claim about the world, we need to feed in a second argument. Here it's Bart. He comes in and knocks out the lambda x, and we substitute him for the variable x in the body of the expression. And now we're just checking whether this pair is a member of this larger set. It isn't, so the final value is false. In our little toy model, Bart admires Maggie is false. From here on out, the semantic types are going to get even higher and more complex. We'll start with intersective adjectives. In our framework, we're going to assume that all adjectives denote functions on noun phrase meanings. The first argument to the function is thus itself a one-place function. The second is an entity. And as before, we're returning a truth value once both of the arguments have come in. The truth conditions first assert membership in the set of all female entities. And the second conjunct does whatever the noun does. For example, if the incoming noun meaning corresponding to f is the set of all school children, then we'll be saying that the x, when it comes in, is both a female entity and a school child entity. The and part is the intersectivity for these adjectives. For non-intersective adjectives, the semantic type is the same as for the intersective ones. So a function comes in, and then an entity, and finally we return a truth value. But the determination of truth is different. For instance, whereas female asserts that the noun meaning is true of the entity x, alleged doesn't do that. It just says someone claimed that the noun meaning was true of the entity x. Next, we'll look at negation. This lexical item has some independent interest. From regular propositional logic, we get a view of negation as a reverser of truth values. Here it is as a function, very simple. If a t comes in, 
an F comes out, and if an F comes in, a T comes out. The trouble is that syntactically, negation is typically a verb phrase modifier, and verb phrases denote functions, not truth values. So it looks like we can't make use of this simple negation. However, the lambda calculus provides us with just the tools we need for reconciliation. The idea is that we sort of trick the negation function by giving it something truth valued. Here, if f is a function from entities to truth values, and x is an entity, then f of x is a suitable argument to our negation. So far, so good. Now we abstract out the f and the x to get the meaning we want. First, bind the x, and then the f. The result is a meaning of the same type as an adjective meaning. It's looking for a function, and it returns a function. Thus, for example, we can give it the meaning of run as an argument. We do the lambda conversion, and the result is a new predicate, the verb phrase meaning not run. Notice that this expression here denotes either a t or an f. If x runs, then this is a t, and the negation returns an f. The lambda x will in some sense correspond to the subject of the sentence, so we sort of wove the truth functional negation into the predicate-based compositional environment. It's a powerful technique for getting clean compositional analyses from a simple unified lexicon. Finally, let's look at determiner meanings. These are the most complex meanings in our system. To get warmed up, let's look back at our set-based theory of these meanings. Here's every. It denotes a set of pairs of sets, the set of all such pairs A, B, such that A is a subset of B. It's easy to express this in our function-based grammar. And here I've stretched out the set-theoretic one to show the correspondences more clearly. Whereas before we could talk about sets directly, now we talk about the characteristic set of the incoming functions. Let's see how these work in, con in the context of a larger derivation. Here we have the meaning of every with the child function as its argument. The argument knocks out the lambda f and gets substituted in. The second argument, the meaning of studies, does the same thing, but now with the g argument. It comes in and then gets substituted. In the end, we get something that reduces down to the claim that the children are a subset of the studiers, which is exactly what our previous view delivered. The advantage of the new perspective is that it's easy to incorporate these functional meanings into a very general theory of semantic composition. The full power of the approach will become more evident in the context of our semantic grammar, which is the topic of the next screencast.